All right, I'm going to take a minute here to talk about uh, this gable a little bit. Ow, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stab myself too. So, I'd in a previous video, I'd talked a little bit about this gable, and I'd talked about what all this junk was. And it was basically to strengthen the three foot overhangs that we have because these lookouts were just toenailed down to the top cord of this uh, gable and truss. A good wind and that could just easily tear off or pull up and separate. I mean, toenails are not gonna hold, so we're not gonna hold for long. So I explained how I had made this corner. I put it up, I put these hangers on, and I also got these A34s. But I didn't explain these bird blocks. I was researching, I was in the middle of researching uh, attic venting, and I was unsure whether or not I wanted venting here. So I had them at it just, just in case, in case I would want it there. Uh, because because of the way these lookouts are, they're not going to breathe as well, and I didn't know exactly how I was going to do the attic. At that time, I was planning on putting the air seal down at ceiling level, like on the bottom, you know, bottom face, basically where the sheetrock would be. I was thinking even maybe spraying the backside of the sheetrock with spray foam. Um, but anyways. Uh, Long story short, I settled on putting it up here and giving us a semi-conditioned attic instead. But anyways, back to this. Um, so this ends up working out. If I was to put the attic or the air barrier down there and have a fully vented attic space, having holes along the gable here will interrupt the airflow from, you basically want it coming in at your soffits and going out at the ridge vent. And you also want a proper proportion of venting to your soffits, to your ridge vent. And from the research I had done, I basically came to the conclusion that it was roughly you want a two to one or better uh, ratio between your, your soffit venting and your ridge vent. So that way you don't get any back drafts back down the soffit. You don't want it sucking air in. You want to you want a good pressure blowing air out and keeping any air and water from getting sucked in. That was the that's the understanding I have. So, and that's how I, I gapped all my boards, or basically the way I did my soffits with all the cedar, the gaps in between the boards add up to basically two inches. And up here I've got one inch on each side. Back to these bird blocks. Now that I'm adding this air barrier here, these little bays would be completely sealed if it, if it wasn't for these bird blocks allowing them to vent to the outside. So now these bird blocks, because they aren't, you know, each bay is individually going to have its own intake down in the soffit and then its own vent up out of the roof. And they will, you know, they're not, there won't be any airflow between the bays. Okay, so. I don't know if I covered that well enough, but that'll do for now. But the other thing I wanted to point out was on this gable end, oh, a couple of things. So not only was the, um, I think this connection at first not good enough for the forces it might experience, but this, the way that the bottom of this gable was connected to the top plate was not good enough either. On the plans, it showed plywood extending up past the top, both past the double top plates of the wall and connecting into the bottom cord of the truss. Um, but that was not done. They ran their sheets just straight up to the top of the wall. Then they set this thing up. They had sheeted this on the ground and then they just set it straight on there and toenailed it into the, into the double top plates. So again, it's just toenails. So in a big uplift, not only could the roof peel up, but this whole gable could just come up. 
and you're just relying on you know the ends here some hurricane clips and so these and like and the way they they did it there's no hurricane clip in the corner because of the backing for the sheetrock if you can see that so the first hurricane clip is actually back two feet on each side so the whole this whole two feet of house and i've seen videos on youtube and wind tunnel tests where the whole where this connection is the point that fails and the whole roof just comes off <laughs> i would hope that those hurricane clips could hold it but uh since this is going to be our house for our family for generations hopefully i don't ever want to have to worry about it so i spent you know an extra few hours and i really beefed it up so you could see I got double two by sixes there, 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 and there. And they all line up with double studs in the walls, except for this one, this goes to the, to the header. And then I've got thick, beefy straps that go nailed into that and down into the studs or the header here, and down into the studs below. Big straps. And then I also, this is, this is what the framers put in, this one brace, and it goes down there. And so I added this guy here. And so I think we're gonna have plenty of racking that way. <laughs> okay, so there's that. And you know, it is what it is. This is just what happens on job sites. And if you're not there really checking things out, things will get missed. You know, the inspector would never have really checked this. Um, it's just, yeah, anyways, and it, you know, it might not ever have been a problem, but we live right on this, uh, a very windy coastline and, uh, you know, we're, this house had to be engineered really high for really high wind loads, like 135 or 140. And it, it uh, and the pole barn too, it had to be like re-engineered for super high wind loads because we're within uh, a certain, I think 600 feet of the coastline. So, so yeah, so you have really serious uh, wind loads on this house and th that definitely would not have met it, but it would have just gone through and been passed and no one would have known until it tore off. <laughs> but anyways, um, the other last, very last thing I might as well mention because you might be looking at them these guys, so, so that when they nailed the sheeting on, they used, you know, pretty long nails, um, which is fine, whatever. It's probably better to use shorter, you know, if they would have used like two inch, that would have probably been perfect. Um, but these are probably two and a halfs. And you see these big fatties coming through here. These are actually the ones I put in. And those are what's holding in the rain screen. Well, partially what's holding in the rain screen. I also nailed it with three and a half inch ring shank um, stainless steel nails. And I don't see any poking through because they're not long enough, but they should be buried in these members. And I don't see any that I'm, well, here's, yeah, there's, there's one I missed. So it's easy to spot my nails because they're the stainless steel ones. But, um, you see on the gables, I probably should have switched to a, um, a four inch because these are five inch spikes. They're 20 pennies. You see my three and a half inch. But if I would have used an inch shorter, I wouldn't have gotten so much blowout on the back. To deal with all these nails sticking out, uh, well, the blue skin on the, on the outside should be a pretty good seal, even being peppered with these giant nails. But uh, I'm gonna spray this whole wall Try to get in here if I can with spray foam all the way down. And I might put a strip of sheetrock so that they could just spray all the way out to the sheetrock. And between the blue skin going up on the outside and this foam coming here, I think we're going to get a pretty good seal there. I mean, it would have to suck air kind of up through the, sh the sheetrock and behind these. It would be a really tough path for the air to follow long rambling tangent information whatever 
there's a lot of details to explain and if you're interested these are questions you should have so anyways I thought I'd answer some of them and I'm sure there's a lot more but that's all the time I want to spend yapping I gotta get some work done